So I have hit record and we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks everybody for joining. It's good to uh, see your little gray boxes here <laughs> that you've joined. Um, I'm excited about this program. Lane is always a good speaker. I learn something every time I talk to him. So um, this will be a good one. I know I've certainly got a lot of questions about trees lately that have come in and the help desk has had a lot. So this will be very informative. Um, just one housekeeping thing before we get started. This time you do have the ability to um, speak to the group, but I'm going to mute all the microphones and ask that you don't um, jump in. If you have questions, you should be able to put those into the chat box and then we'll ask questions at the end. Um, but it's it's great to be here with you and I'll with that, I'll let Wayne get started. OK. Don't see myself yet, but. Wayne, you should be able to share your screen. OK, I can share, but I don't see any folks. OK, here we go. Microsoft PowerPoint. There we go. Yep, people are viewing it. Let's see. You're sharing. OK, let me go ahead and start it then. And let's see. OK, everybody see that? Yes. OK. OK, we're going to be talking about trees and tree problems today, uh, especially for Williamson County. And of course, one of the the thing that we always have to worry about is uh, the tree selection that we make sure we have the trees that are really designated for this county. So I'm going to start by uh, a little thing. It says tree selection starts with deciding the tree's purpose. Let's see if I can get rid of this other thing up here. I'll, I'll put it over here. Let's see, um, do you? want shade, you want fall color, you want form or texture. Do you want a flowering or an ornamental evergreen or deciduous tree, a fruit or berry tree for show or food, tree for wildlife, shelter or nesting, and then an architecture, architectural buffer zones, which when I was working over at uh, the uh, place over by uh, where Academy is now, they all, everybody came in and wanted to have some kind of a privacy screening thing. So it was kind of hard to to try to please each one of them because a lot of them were not from this part of the world. They were actually from California, most of them. So you had to explain really a lot about what kind of trees we can grow here. So. OK, so if you're looking here, whoops, go back. All right, there's a different size trees that we have here. The small would be up to 20 feet. Uh, medium trees would be 20 to 40 feet. And then large trees would be 40 feet or more. So there is a way that uh, can help. Get that doggone thing off of there. There we go. Um, there's a website. It's on the Texas Forest Service. Uh, dot web dot tamu dot edu and it's called an express tree selector a custom tree selector and then tree planning and care so what you can do is you can go to that one then under express tree selector you can say select your county and then you select the williamson county and it will ask you what size trees would you like either small medium or large and then it'll let you show uh, the trees that are available or that really should fit into this county. So I'm going to go through a few of them here just to show you some of the ones that we have that will grow here and, and do a good job. So under small trees, uh, the Anacacho orchid tree, a really beautiful tree, has some beautiful uh, leaves on it even when the, the limbs are not on it. So it's 6 to 12 feet high. Uh, Desert Willow, and uh, this is the one that was out at the old extension office out there. It was beautiful. I love the color on this one. It is deciduous and it gets up to about 20 feet tall. 
the golden lead ball, uh, golden ball lead tree, hard to say all at one time, 12 to 15 feet tall, has these beautiful orange balls on it. And um, it's a pretty slender tree, doesn't have a lot of leaves on it, but it's a be really beautiful when it starts putting out all of its its uh, blossoms. So, uh, the Palo Verde Desert Museum, uh, that is about 25 feet tall and 25 feet wide. This is the one that's in my front yard that I've had for more than 10 years, and it is still doing really great. And once it uh, blooms, you can see it gets up close. It's got beautiful uh, yellow blossoms with a little red center in them there, and it just continuously blooms all summer long. It is deciduous, so it loses its leaves, but it's beautiful all summer long. Uh, Mexican plum, which is a great spring bloomer. Uh, if you love to have plums to can, you can actually use these uh, for making jellies and stuff. Otherwise, they're just kind of going to, I guess, hang out in your landscape. But a lot of people make good jelly out of those. So, And it's a beautiful plant early in the spring. Uh, Mexican Buckeye, uh, this particular one was is out at the community uh, center in Georgetown, and it's been there for a good while, too. It's really pretty, and especially in the springtime, and it has these wonderful little balls on it that have three seeds inside them, which people think look like Buckeyes, so they, or I guess it could be a doe eye, but it's better to call it a Buckeye, I guess, than it does a doe eye, so. Uh, of course, everybody knows about the red buds. The red buds do really well around here. Uh, we have different colors. This is the one that's kind of a pink color. Then you can see this one is kind of an, a dark purple color. And this is a different tree over here. So uh, the possum hoth, uh, the ilex decidua, same as the regular uh, yopons, but this one has the red berries and it loses its leaves. Somebody's requesting something. I don't control the share. Okay, well, only the females have berries on it. I don't know. And then we have the Texas Mountain Laurel. Uh, can be a tree or a shrub. Uh, this one is also at the um, community center there in the park. Uh, San Gabriel Park in Georgetown, and it is beautiful. It's been there for years. But then you can also have one as a shrub like this, which has a beautiful thing. These are the first ones that bloom in the springtime, and they really smell wonderful. People think uh, seem to think they smell like grape Kool-Aid. I don't know that I've ever smelled grape Kool-Aid, but I'm sure that it smells wonderful. Medium trees, we go to those. We got Eve's necklace, which is an unusual tree. Uh, this one is actually out at the old extension office also. And it has these wonderful long berries that look like necklaces. It's kind of a sparse looking tree as far as uh, the leaves and stuff goes, but it's a, a very beautiful little tree. It has great uh, seeds on it and you can brag, brag to everybody that you've got an Eve's necklace tree. Monterey Oaks, another great one that does really well around here. It's one of the white oaks, so it's in one of the ones that we want to have in our um, in our yards and stuff. And you can see that the leaves are beautiful here, the nice shaped leaves. Uh, this one is also out at the extension office, the old extension office. Uh, a red oak, the uh, Orcus Texana, um, have different beautiful fall color on it. So, and you can see these usually have multi-stem branches on them. Sometimes you'll get one that's not, but very beautiful tree. And we'll talk more about that one later when we get to some tree problems, though. So. And large trees, we have the burr oak, which has these great big old huge acorns that you can use and kind of spray on golden color or silver color, make great ornaments and stuff to hang on your trees. Uh, you can see this is at the old extension office too. Beautiful tree there. Wonderful. Does a great job here. Is not susceptible to oak weld. So. Chinkapin oak, 
Another one is that extension office, and you can go out there and see all of these. I like this one because it has these leaves that are kind of crinkly on the edge, and they really show up pretty. Uh, the Montezuma ball cypress, another one that uh, we used to think would probably take a lot more water. We did have one of these uh, growing out there, but I think during probably 2011, it probably gave up the ghost because it probably didn't get enough water. But it's a beautiful tree. If you've got any place that close to water, this would re re do really well also. The Schumard Oak, um, this is my neighbor's tree right here that does a, uh, every leaf on this tree will fall off later and come into my yard. So, but it is a pretty tree. This is it, the way it looks in this fall. So it's really pretty. This is the plateau live oak, uh, which is the ones we mostly see around here. Um, they grow in mots, which are, you know, a bunch of them coming up from the same shared roots and so forth. But they are beautiful little young trees and usually see a whole lot of them at one place. The other one, this is a, the uh, Quercus virginiana, which the ones we see more on the southeast side of, of our county, and uh, this grows especially well down in the Houston area. But up here, we can still grow them. I'm not sure that we could probably grow it on the west side of uh, I-35, but does well on the east side. So, and that's the other thing you have to think of is what kind of soil you have. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later also. And of course, we have our state tree, which is the pecan tree. Uh, everybody wants pecans, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later on also. Okay, let's talk about some problems. Uh, our studies indicate that the shorter tree life is due to 10 different reasons. Trees planted in the wrong location, you know, that's what I was talking about, but getting per the particular tree that's good for your location. Planted too deep or too shallow, and we see a lot of that. The root ball had defects when planted, and we're going to talk about that a little later too. Trees not adapted to the local soil or the climate, um, you know, west side, east side of I-35. Soil compacted by pedestrians or vehicles, and we have our wonderful builders that, to thank for that a lot of times. Limited space for root growth, and you can see that kind of in this picture right here, the got these in the, uh, I think, I forgot what uh, Jane called it, but it's a, like a devil's area or something like that. Uh, soil was added or removed after planting, and the tree was improperly staked. There was improper fertilization, and they had weed eater or other mechanical injuries. Weed eaters are a bane for our trees. Okay, avoid the problems with your trees. If so, if you want to plant them, avoid blocking any visible uh, street signs or street corners. Uh, avoid planting trees too close together, where these two trees are right here together. Avoid blocking access to utility transformers. Everyone in my neighborhood, and we're in the co-op, uh, just got a nice little shock because they came by and took all the greenery from around all of the transformers and a lot of folks had a lot of really fancy stuff around there right now there's mulch around them so they're going to come in and because they have to be sure that they can get to those things when we have a problem a uh, big one i used to work for a power company and this is a really big one avoid planting large trees near utility lines plant trees smaller than 20 feet instead of the tall ones. Avoid planting too close to your house, chimney or other structures, because uh, everybody thinks when they plant one, they don't realize how big that's really gonna get. And then avoid encroaching on a neighbor, blocking views or shading your garden. If you're trying to do a vegetable garden, you want to have plenty of sun out there. Plant for available growing space. This is your tree, I mean, your house right here, you wanna have a medium tree here, maybe a small one in the front, your large trees back at least 
12 feet away from the uh, edge of your house and far wise you want that to have to be 30 feet away um, but you know that's not possible in some of the small places we have so you need to have a really a, a medium tree or something back there that's not as big as these of course the mediums you want to put those away uh, back also let's talk a little bit about the how to be, to get a good tree a, like a good quality tree and you want a, a high quality tree has enough sound roots to support healthy growth has a single central trunk or leader a trunk free of mechanical wounds and wound uh, and wounds from uh, incorrect pruning, strong form with well spaced, firm attached branches, leaves with good color and no obvious insect or disease damage. You're paying a lot for these things, so you're the one that gets to choose what you buy. Free uh, tree flare should be obvious. That's one of the big things. Sometimes they will plant the tree further down in the the um, pots when it should be up with the root flare up above. And then healthy roots should fill up the pot but not be circling. And you can remove the root ball from the pot and look. If the nursery will not let you do that, then you should not buy from them. And of course, it just the opposite on this one over here, undersized yellow leaves, uh, dense cover of weeds in the thing which means it's been in there for a long time uh roots coming outside of the pot means it's been in the pot way too long and of course if any obvious wound or anything avoid the trees with circling roots inside the container and like i said also remove the the root ball from the tree so you can be sure okay this is what the root ball should look like right here it's got good old roots in there and it's all kind of spread out you don't want any circling roots like this that have been in the pot too long and started circling or root bound which means there's no soil in there because it's full of roots all together and even though these look like they're pretty nice roots here i still would not want one that's completely root bound so that's one of the things you've got to really look for um, planting your tree the top of the root ball should be level with the ground right here you want it to put a, actually a little bit higher than when you plant it because it's going to sink down a little bit so i would say plant it with maybe a an inch or so above the ground level that way when it sinks down it'll be more or less even with the top of the soil you want to mulch it but not up against the tree and this is a trick right here that you can do you can put a, a two liter plastic bottle around it that will kind of help keep uh, the weed eaters away from it for a while when you're planting it before you actually put the root ball in there partially flood the hole with a and that way you can then sit it in there that gets the bottom part of it because sometimes it's hard to get it all wet when you're planting the tree you want to cut in roots that are circling the container and i'm not so sure that works as well i would rather see one that didn't have any circling roots that you had to cut the bottom of the root ball on firm soil and then backfill the planting hole with the original soil now you folks that live on the west side of i-35 are going to have a lot of fun trying to scratch up enough soil to go back in there uh probably have to pile back in some of the rocks that you got out to start with but anyway we want to get as much of the native soil back in as possible if you give it too much wonderful soil in there it will the roots will never spread out and get out to the where they really need to be to pick up water and so forth so okay once you're finishing the job you want to remove the tags and labels do not stake the trunk unless the tree has a large crown or the planting is situated on a windy site or where people may push them over. That seems to be a fun thing for kids to do sometime. And you want to stake for a maximum of one year. And evergreens, you rarely need uh, staking, but we don't have a lot of evergreens except on the very southeast side of uh, Williamson County. Soak the soil well, making sure no air pockets form between the roots. And then 
Add two to three inches of mulch, taking care to keep it away from the trunk. Prune any basil suckers, those sprouts that grow out of the base of the tree, prune those off. Do not prune the terminal leader of branch tips and prune any codominant leaders or narrow crotch angles. Prune any rubbing or cross branches and prune any broken branches. And this is a little diagram of how that looks. He wants to say that you remove any of the branches shown with the dotted lines and you can see these are the root suckers or water sprouts down at the bottom take those out uh, don't leave any branch stubs sticking up and we'll show you how to prune uh, properly in just a moment uh, shorten the low branches to develop trunk thickness there's you want to have a terminal leader in here so if there's a, another one that's competing trying to come up through like this you want to take that out and of course any that are crossing uh, growing inside or crossing or broken, you can take those off at any time. And it says always make pruning cuts on the outside of the branch collar. And I'll show you how that really looks in just a moment. Also, you want to disinfect your pruning tools when you are using them. Uh, you can uh, use a, a regular household disinfectant to, and, and do it with those. Always follow the labels for disinfecting. And after de disinfecting, dry the tools and then apply a light coat of oil to the metal parts. That'll make your your tools last a lot longer and also they will help with keep them sharp. So. Okay, always paint the cuts of any oaks, and that's any oaks, regardless of what they are. Because we're we're going to talk a little more about Texas oak wilt in a little bit, and we we'll want you to be sure you protect any of the oaks that are susceptible to oak wilt. Anyway, starting out, this is pruning a large limb off. You want to do an undercut underneath the, the one. It says, here's the collar of the tree right here. You want to go out a little ways, make the first cut underneath, and then come back with a second cut on the top. That will allow, and a little bit to the um, further out the, the branch than the, the one you've cut. This will allow the branch to cut and break off instead of stripping all the bark off of your tree. And then you'll come back for your final cut and do right where the branch collar is, cut it right there. Don't cut it right up against the tree, but cut it out where the branch collar is. So how do you know what the branch collar looks like? Well, here you see. This is a branch collar right here. You can see there's a little indention right on the the, the uh, tree itself that tells you where the branch collar is and then a proper cut will heal over like this this is one that's cut up too far and you can see that it's not really doing very well so you want to be sure you do it the proper way and if you want some more information there's aggiehorticulture.tmu.edu ornamentals and natives as uh, an index uh, alphabetical trees that's kind of hard to find but it, i would google it or you know search in, in the website for texas a and m and you can find these these were put together by benny simpson who is a really great um naturalist and he's got uh, information about all the native trees in texas other important aspects of the soil is that uh, we need to uh, they like a neutral pH, which is uh, not around here. So, you know, this is what happens to different things as the pH gets higher or lower. Uh, for nitrogen, it's get ideal between 6 and about 8 uh, pH. Phosphorus about the same. Potassium and sulfur, calcium and so forth. Magnesium really... Uh, doesn't do well if you get low below eight so and then of course iron um uh, cobalt i think cobalt and i forgot what to you copper zinc and and manganese are the ones that will actually not do good on a higher ph uh, if you're trying to do pecans and you want to have pecans that uh, 
produce good fruit, uh, there's a, a list of ones, and you can call the Extension Office to get that, or the Pecan Growers Association. But uh, for Central Texas, we have a list of the Caddo, Desirable, Lipan, Mandan, Ochokini, Pawnee, some of them, a bunch of Indian names. So those are the ones that will grow best in this area. So you can always find that information out by calling the Extension Office or going to the Pecan Growers Association. Uh, just a little thing here. How many insects feed on pecans? Well, there's 20 nut feeders, 103 foliage feeders, 67 twig, branch, and root feeders. So you've got your uh, chore cut out for you to grow those, but it's well worth it. Uh, additional tree selections resources, uh, Williamson County Master Gardener website, and then Landscape Trees, Tree Selection and Planning, a guide for Williamson County, and then Nuts and Fruit Trees, uh, Planning Guide, and you can get all of these off of our um, either Extension website or the Master Gardener website. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about basic tree biology in Oak Wilt in Central Texas. And uh, I took out a lot of stuff on this because I thought it was boring, and it was, so we'll try this. Our basic tree biology says that trees have developed a natural defense mechanism to protect them and allow for establishment of populations. Uh, they have physical thorns, they have a chemical fragrance, toxicity, and so forth to keep you away from them and keep other things away from them also. The, um, they will generally glow, grow in most areas that we choose the right one, but sometimes you want to see if it's actually a wetter climate or if it's really dry, and that's the trees that are adapted to that particular thing. Also, many trees have been able to adapt to man-made sites. As many times have you seen this, where we've got a big, huge tree sitting between a sidewalk and asphalt and the street and you wonder how some of those trees make it. And they seem to make it fairly well, which is uh, it's amazing sometimes. Also, uh, let's talk a little bit about the root structure. We've always heard that tree roots are a reflection of the top. If you look at the roots, they're going to be a reflection at the bottom, and that's not really true. The tree roots are within the top 18 inches of the soil, and they will spread at least two and a half times, usually, the drip line of the tree. So you could be way out here watering your tree, and you want to be sure. Usually the drip line, you can do pretty good by watering out that far, but you may have to go further out just to take care of your the roots, because most of your feeder roots are even further out than that. And they're in the top 18 inches of soil. So we do need to water deeps ever so often, you know, which will help you at least get down to the 18 inches if possible. Because you can see this is how the roots look. You can see it, especially in the hill country like this, poor roots are having to go, they're staying up on the top, but they will go in between all of the limestone and stuff that we have here. So it's amazing sometimes how they really can get down through all of that without and still be alive. So, okay, tree health is the key when dealing with stresses. Their energy reserves are needed to recover from defoliation, from non-infectious diseases, insects, or, environment, or environmental stresses. And that's, for example, we have drought, heat, fungal leaf spots, uh, and that throws web uh, worms and leaf rollers. And then I want to mention this little thing called coat it, which is compartmentalization of decay in trees. And that was uh, developed by Alex Shigo. Uh, compartmentalization means that uh, vascular plants, really different from us greatly when faced with wounding or infectious diseases, Unlike us, they lack an immune system. Instead, they have developed a process to cope known as compartmentalization, which means a wounded tree will not be capable of healing a wound by regenerating 
destroyed tissue. Instead, the wound is walled off from the rest of the vascular system by the formation of tylosis, thus not allowing decay to spread into the rest of the system. And there are four walls of those boundaries, and I'm not going to go into those four walls, but just to let you know that there are four different walls they can uh, wall off to, to help save themselves. Uh, then we have compaction, you know, where you start up parking your car on the, the roots of your trees. Uh, sometimes we, uh, our builders will run a caterpillar or something across there, which packs the soil down real good before we ever get there. And then they'll put six inches of soil on the top of that and cover all the rest of it up and make you think you've got some really, really good soil. And of course, girdling trees, be careful what you put around there. Uh, we see this a lot, even with the uh, stakes that we put on there. If you don't take those off, they'll actually girdle the tree and kill it. But this particular one is where they've actually tied a fence, uh, probably barbed wire around it and didn't take it off and it will actually kill the tree. And of course, we've got the growing space. Now, this is taken down in Houston and you can see that this is pavement out here. This is sidewalk. And they've got the tree with a little bitty iron thing here that some water can get in there. I don't know where it's going to come from, but it can get in there in some uh, extreme circumstances. So it makes you wonder how in the world they ever grow. And yet they seem to be doing well. Okay, what can go wrong? Tree diseases in Texas? Wow, look at all those. We've got Abiotics, which would be herbicides, drought, and other uh, abiotics, uh, declines, lots of different declines, black spot, oak leaf curl, uh, leaf rust, unknown virus on hackberry, brown spots, needle rust, um, everything you can possibly think of. Then, then we get down to the cankers, which are on the branch and trunk of the tree. And we have probably seen most of these at our help desk at one time or another. Uh, bacterial wet wood has been uh, one that we've seen a lot here lately. Dutch elm disease, probably we don't have a lot of elms left down here that would be susceptible to that. Oak wilt, native elm wilt, uh, fusarium wilt, still have that. Hindwood nematode, bacterial leaf scorch, fire blight, lethal yellows on palms. And then we have the root rots. So a lot of those, and we see a lot of those too. The big one in around here is cotton root rot which lives in our soil, and it kills a lot of plants, not only trees, but others also. So then we have the non-pathogens, which are their city mole, a ball moss and, and lichens. The city mole is usually caused by the um, uh, different uh, aphids and so forth that we have that are excreting honeydew, they call it, and that turns into a city mole. So, so let's get into the oak wilt. Uh, background oak wilt, uh, first described in 1941 in Wisconsin, considered to be a significant threat to oak resources, and then after 40 years of research and management, proved to be significant in Texas. Originally, they didn't think it would get to Texas because they thought it was too hot. And you can see where they said, don't prune in May or June because it's a lot cooler up there than it is down here, so it doesn't get hot and the uh, the little uh, beetles that uh, trans uh, transmit the disease, general, they don't like it when it gets hot. So, so oak wilt dist distribution in Texas, this is back in 2007. So it was a few counties, even way back then, and even more now, this is 2009. And you can see Williamson County is right here. So we're right in the middle of all of it. But you can see that it's mostly in the central part of Texas. Uh, Harris County down here had um, one or two cases, but they haven't really had very much down there. And it, a lot of it has to do with not having as many oaks down there as we have here. But all of Central Texas and all the way up to Dallas and so forth, and even up in Amarillo, I've got some up there. So why did we come? Uh, why did it become such a, an epidemic in the live oak savannas of Central Texas? 
Well, basically because that's we have a dominance of live oaks and red oaks here. We don't have a lot of pines and, and uh, other types of trees that are not susceptible. We do have a lot of live oaks and red oaks. So and we also have a lot of other oaks. And then the past influence of European settlement where we changed our land use practices. We used to have uh, fires that burned all the time, which helped control all of this. And now we have fire control where you, uh, you almost cannot do a controlled burn anymore. And then overgrazing, uh, we actually brought in a lot of cattle and stuff that we're really not supposed to be in this part of the world. I mean, we were the tall grass prairies at one time and the buffalo came through here, but we didn't have a lot of other animals other than deer. So we brought in way too many. We overgrazed everything and that allowed all these little live oaks and other scrub oaks and stuff to come up. And then of course, current wounding that we have now, we have anything that gets a wound is going to be susceptible to the oak well senses here. Um, okay, the, the, it, this is the botanical name for it. It's um, uh, Certocystis phagatherum, and it is a fungus, and it's a vascular parasite, which means that it kills healthy trees. It feeds on the watering portion of the trees, and, and it basically starves the tree to death without, since it can't get any water. It is a poor saprophyte, which means once the tree dies, it can't live there anymore. So uh, produces two kinds of spores. It forms the mats of tissue under bark on certain trees, which are really the oak tree, the red oak trees. It is heat sensitive and it occurs in 22 other states, but the origin is unknown where it came from disables the water conducting systems of the trees. Okay, our red oaks, uh, the Spanish oak, the blackjack oaks, and the water oaks. We don't have many water oaks around here, but we do have a lot of Spanish oaks and blackjack oaks. And those are the most extremely sensitive, susceptible ones. The white oaks, which are resistant and less susceptible, would be our, any of the white oaks, which would be, you know, shin oaks, lathe oaks, the Mexican white oaks and the post oaks. So, and then the live oaks are variable depending on um, how they're treated and how they get it. So, the southern live oak is the one that I um, showed you earlier, which is the one that usually grow a little further uh, east than we have here, but we have a lot of the plateau live oaks. And this is a kind of a uh, a little chart that Dr. Apple put together. You can see down here, uh, David Apple, he put this together, but it kind of gives you a little walkthrough of how uh, the red oak phase and the live oak phase works. So we'll start, start off with a healthy red oak, and then it gets a, a wound on it, and then it, these little beetles come through, and they come down, and they will uh, infect this tree. Well, then there's two options then. One, it goes and it can get into the root connections on those also, but usually we don't have a lot of root connections on those. But then if it's uh, in the early summertime, an infected red oak is gonna die, usually within six weeks. Could be a little longer sometimes. If it's in the late summer and it gets infected, it will probably live through the winter, but in the uh, it'll be a dying red oak during this time, and then it'll be a dead red oak next spring. And then these red oaks were the ones that form the mass that uh, contain the uh, fungus that the little uh, nadoodlid beetles actually feed on. So these are little beetles coming in and they're flying in and taking care of that. Then, then we start the whole cycle again and where they come in and uh, infect the wound on the red oaks. So the live oak phase is we have a healthy live oak. It actually will get this 
a wound and then it will come through here. It will be a, become a diseased live oak then. And you can see this is where we've seen a lot of this happen. But it will spread through the root connections through all the other oaks. Then it will also go up to, uh, you know, rapidly spreading oak martel, um, uh, march, martiality, I can't say it today. Then, then we don't get any beet, no mats or no beetles from this because it doesn't form the mats. And then the root connections are actually where they grow together underneath the ground and they will spread from tree to tree that way. A diseased live oak will sometimes look like this. You, know, you see part of it dying and part of it staying alive. You'll see some healthy portions on there. On a diseased red oak, it's kind of hard because it looks like it starts dying from the top and then the leaves will start just turning a kind of a bronze color. And like I say, that's the first stage and usually within six weeks, it's probably going to die. Uh, foliar symptoms. Uh, these are what we see a lot of times, but it doesn't have to be this way. But live oaks, usually you can see these and, and I've seen a lot of these on the ground, so I know that that's one of the symptoms. Red oaks are kind of hard to tell because you can see these kind of turn kind of a bronze looking color. They may even turn uh, a, a brown color. Um, you can see down here that's different on this particular one. It doesn't really, it's just kind of the opposite. So you can't always go by that, but that's probably uh, a really good indication if we do have that. Uh, this is the fungal mat, and uh, actually this has been shaved off. You can see where it's been cut back. So the fungal mat is underneath here. It's really sweet smelling. The beetle can be attracted from a mile away and come to that, and then they can spread for at least another mile when they go. But this is what it looks like when you see it on the tree. So it's just a little crack in there, and you won't see that until you see uh, this underneath it. So you'd have to peel it off to, to actually see that portion of it. And this is the size of the little uh, nudilid beetles. They're really, really small, so it's really hard to see. I'm about the size of a matchstick head. So very small, but very destructive. So usually you can tell, but if you really want to be sure, you can take uh, bowl and branch samples to confirm the presence of it. And what you do is you take these um, cut off portions of it from the tree, you package it up. It has to be packaged in a specific way and it has to be kept cool. So you have to have dry ice and some of the other things. And there's specific instructions of how to do that on the website. This is uh, the Texas Plant Diagnostic, Disease Diagnostic Lab, and they will do the testing for you. I think it costs about 35 bucks. I hadn't checked lately, but they have a lot of different uh, things that they test for. So you can do it. You can go on here. It will actually tell you on this link how to package it up to get it to them so that it stays alive. Otherwise, they won't be able to tell if it's dead. Okay, oh, well, options you want to prevention is the, the best way to do it. First, you can always start with your diagnosis, but then we'll, uh, we'll assume that you already know that you've got uh, that. Okay, you want to avoid wounding in the spring from February the 1st through the end of June. And prevention, use wound paints regardless of when you actually uh, prune a, an oak tree, use wound paints. Does not have to be a specific paint. You can use water-based paint. You can use, uh, you know, some people like to use the old black looking stuff that we used to use years ago, but this one, I see something that, I guess um, I saw that pop up maybe uh, Kate is a answering some of these questions. I can't see it on mine. So anyway, use the uh, the wound paints on every time you cut any kind of an oak tree. Okay. 
And then uh, this is one of the other things I wanted to bring up to you is a lot of times this things get spread because people um, sell firewood. They will actually um, have one that's still got the, the, the virus in it. They will move that to another part of the country and there then they are affected too. <clears throat> to do be sure that it's not um, still infected when you want to uh, use it. You can use it yourself uh, in your in your fireplace. Fire kills all of it. So, but it should be seasoned, well dried uh, when you are trying to sell it or something. Fire kills all living things. Burn during the season. Uh, cover infected red oak logs with clear plastic. And then it's killed by high temperatures that is greater than 98.6 degrees. So uh, you can, when you're covering it, if you do, you need to put plastic all the way down underneath the ground, cover the whole thing, and then put the soil up on it so that none of those little babies can get out of there. And you want to leave it there until it completely dries out. Uh, direct control is uh, intravascular injection uh, with fungicides. I didn't go into the trenching side of it because that uh, I think most of us don't really have a way to do trenching in our, our yards unless you've got a, a large area because you have to go in and trench more than 100 feet and you have to take all the trees out within that time. So. Uh, the injections or several different ones of fungicide is technique and uh, implementation. It's used on trees under disease pressure on advancing margins of disease centers, which means you don't go into the ones that are already dead. You go to the ones that are on the outside of that. And those are the ones you'd want to treat. It's therapeutic and it's also preventative if you get it to the right time. And the rate is based on the size of the tree. Um, what we do is we come in and sometimes they'll use a, a air, uh, air hammer type thing. It's the air fluffer. It's not a hammer, but they come in and they uncover all the root flares that are on the bottom of the tree. And then they take a drill and they drill holes ever so often in here. And you put these little plastic things in there, the, the, um, uh, and, and it's the uh, insecticide is, or the whatever, gyricide is in this and it's under pressure. So it actually puts pressure and goes actually into the tree itself. And that's a pretty good process. Sometimes it takes a long time to get that in there. Sometimes it goes pretty fast, but it's, uh, and it's not 100% effective. We think it, that uh, probably does last a good while. So there are several others, um, uh, different products. This uh, this one right here, propo uh, propoconazole, is actually uh, sold under the brand name of Alamo, and I think that's the one we've used. But here's some some new ones that they've come up with, tree injectors. Uh, they have some that actually you inject higher up on the tree. Not sure how effective those are, but uh, here's the other ones, the little ones that they actually put in all around the bottom. And those, uh, I understand now, are a little more effective than they uh, originally thought they would be. So that's another alternative right now. But you need to hire someone that knows what they're doing that actually will come out and do a good job and not somebody that's a kind of a fly by not person that comes by to your house and say, I think you've got oak will. Please, please let me treat your tree for you. Because sometimes they'll try to do that and there's actually no oak will there. Um, you just have to be careful when we're doing that. Okay, so you want to be sure that uh, it's reliable, that they have verifiable documentation of research results. It must increase the survival of treated trees over the natural population. Uh, has to be safe, economical, and this is not really 
economical. A lot of this costs quite a bit of money and it has to be reasonably easy to apply. I would go again, let's always say that we want to, after we do all this, we want to plant resistant trees. So I've given you some information about the trees and what they, uh, the ones that we actually recommend here. Uh, we'll surely we'll have some uh, other trees that we can recommend for you anytime you need them. But basically, right now it's the red oaks and the uh, live oaks that are causing all the problems. So you have to be really careful with those. People are still buying them right now, and, and uh, chances that you get oak wilt in your particular area could be high or could be low, depending on where you live. But it's also getting um, quite a bit of publicity. So plant resistant trees. So let's go to the end. Hope your tree doesn't look like this one. And then I'll open it up for any questions that uh, maybe Kate had. I thought she was answering quite a few of them on there. So, yeah, Wayne, I, I think I'm keeping up with the questions so far, but some of these are really good questions. So I'll I'll share just to make sure everybody sees them. Uh, this one. Can you move firewood from infected live oak without a problem? Um, you know, is there a difference between infected red oak and, and live oak firewood? Yeah. The, yeah. Uh, yes, you, uh, the live oak, uh, somebody talked about it. The live oaks do not have the fungal mats. So yes, you can move those. What we're trying to prevent is moving the, the red oaks because they're the ones that have the fungal mats and those are the ones that can spread the, the virus. Live oaks don't have those, so you can actually use those. Okay. And then I'll I'll answer this one out loud because I haven't had a chance to type in the answer from Chenu. She asked if a systemic drench with a midocloprid would work. And I I assume you're talking about for oak wilt, and the answer on that is no. Um, and midocloprid is an insecticide, and oak wilt is a fungal issue, and so. They stick with that um, propiconazole is the chemical name of the fungicide that's been researched and recommended for oak wilt fungus. Mm -hmm. um, and then Annie Burwell, hey Annie, um, asked about um, using propiconazole for hypoxyl and canker. Um, Annie, we don't really have a treatment for hypoxyl and canker. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's something that is just kind of always around um, and doesn't affect trees unless they're weakened by something else. So if your tree has got hypoxyl and canker, it it's fine unless there are enough other stressors that it's going to kill the tree. So there are probably more environmental things that you might need to check. Um, I'll, to be honest, Annie, all the trees I've seen with hypoxyl and canker are already dead because uh, they've just been finished off by the hypoxyl and canker. So I'll have to find out if there is a treatment for it, but I'm not sure that there is a recommended treatment. I've not. <laughs> Somebody. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, somebody was trying to talk there on that. Okay. Somebody have a question? I, we've got a couple more in the chat. Um, From Chinu about her two Schumard oaks were diagnosed with bacterial leaf scorch. She's replaced the trees with Drummond maples, but are worried that they might suffer a similar fate. Uh, hmm. I would just recommend that you make sure you take care of those maples, um, keep them watered, that kind of thing. And I don't don't think bacterial leaf scorch is in the soil. 
so you shouldn't have an issue. No, I wouldn't think so. And I don't know much about German maple, so I wouldn't be able to recommend anything on that. I'd have to look it up. And then Annie asked in the Thrall and Thorndale area, there are a lot of huge oaks dying, perhaps from canker post drought. Um, Annie, I I don't even want to hazard a guess without seeing the trees. Um, you know, we've I've been out that direction and seen trees that last year were dying from uh, too much water the year before. Um, sometimes we'll see trees die several years after a drought. It just takes them a long time. So without really seeing what's going on, hard yeah. to answer that. But holler at me and we'll see if we can figure it out. Yeah, after the 2000, after the 2011 drought, we actually, uh, five years later, the trees were still dying from that one, so. Right. Okay, Wayne, you did a fabulous job as always. Thank you so much for teaching tonight. I enjoyed it. Um, looks like from the comments, lots of others really enjoyed it. Uh, so y'all tune in uh, next month. We will be meeting again. Um, let me get a reminder out for the date. That's November 9th. So we'll do the same registration process on our website. Give us your email address and we'll send you an invitation to the meeting. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thank all of you. Enjoyed it.